1927 Part 2, The Dark Year. During the 1927 koala hunt in central Queensland, three men and their dogs managed to kill and skin 3,600 koalas in 30 days for the international fur industry. Got your attention? This story on the history of Rockhampton and central Queensland is brought to you by the Bizarre Natural History of Australia and Time Safari's Rockhampton Walking Tours. Join us for a walk along Queensland's largest collection of heritage buildings and discover the history of the city. Or take one of the spooky evening tours and uncover the murders and mayhem and if the real Jack the Ripper once stalked the dark alleys of Rockhampton. Now in part one, our previous video was about the fun side of 1927 in Rockhampton with its goat race down Key Street. Well sadly today we learn about one of the darker episodes of the central Queensland region. 1927 was a black year for the conservation of what is arguably the world's most favourite animal. That year hosted the last official legalised slaughter of koalas in Australia. Since Europeans first arrived on the continent, the koala was immediately put under pressure as the interior of the country was investigated, and these explorers began reporting little bears, sloths, and monkeys hanging about in the trees. The continent was colonised by England in 1788. Yet the first koala wasn't seen until 1798 when a servant of the then Governor John Hunter was on a journey to the distant Blue Mountains. We saw no signs of any natives about it, but we saw several sorts of dung of different animals, one of which Wilson called a whombat, which is an animal about 20 inches high with short legs and a thick body forward, with a large head, round ears and very small eyes. It is fat and has much the appearance of a badger. There is another animal, which the natives call Kulawine, which much resembles the sloths in America. Francis Barilia was from a French family that had fled their homeland after supporting the royal family during the French Revolution. Francis had received a commission as an ensign in the New South Wales Corps by Governor Hunter, who later sent the military engineer on an expedition to the Blue Mountains. It was on this trip that the Frenchman noticed the natives had brought portions of a monkey, but they had cut it in pieces and the head, which I should have liked to secure, had disappeared. I could only get two feet through an exchange. I sent these two feet to the governor in a bottle of spirits. Sadly for these men, both accounts would not be printed for nearly a century, and so the fame of being the first to describe a koala fell on someone else. In 1803, the Sydney Gazette reported, an animal whose species was never before found in the colony, in His Excellency's possession, when taken, it had two pups, one of which died a few days since. This creature is somewhat larger than a wombat, and although it might at first appearance be thought much to resemble it, nevertheless differs from that animal. The fore and hind legs are about of an equal length, having five sharp talons at each of the extremities, with which it must have climbed the highest tree with much facility. The fur that covers it is soft and fine, and of a mixed grey colour. The ears are short and open, the graveness of the visage, which differs little in colour from the back, would seem to indicate a more than ordinary portion of, of animal sagity, and the teeth resemble those of a rabbit, and its food consists solely of gum leaves. These animals have been brought to Sydney by Colonel William Patterson, who intended to send the living animals to London. However, in a letter to the head of the Royal Society, Joseph Banks, Patterson noted that the cooler, which I gave the Governor, being the first ever seen here, Mr Lewin made a very bad drawing of it, which the governor informed me he had sent to you. Since that time, many have been caught, brought in and become very domestic. I had a male and female for several months. One of them, the male, ate bread and was particularly fond of tea. I was in great hopes he would have lived till I had the opportunity of sending him to you, but an uncountable accident happened to him and he died soon after. The later governor, Philip Gidley King, also reported the discovery to Banks, explaining that another animal had been added to the natural history of this country. I much fear that their living on leaves alone will make it difficult to send them to England. This proved to be true, as living koalas would not arrive in England for nearly 80 years. Now, the botanist, geologist and paleontologist Robert Brown also wrote a scientific description of a monkey specimen from Illawarra, naming it Dilelphus cooler, after the native name for the animal. Once again, this description would be lost to time, as the paper was only found in the scientist's notes well after his death. Also discovered in the notes was a sketch of the creature by Ferdinand Bauer, and it was by far the most accurate of the early images of these animals. 
It wasn't until Count Paul Strzelecki started to explore the southern regions of future ACT in Victoria that koalas would be seen in good numbers. In fact, it was these native bears that kept Strzelecki and his fellow explorers alive. One of these, James Riley wrote, In the country through which we passed, there was but one animal. It is the size of a small dog and lives in trees. It is called the monkey or native bear. These we procured sometimes by shooting, sometimes by the natives climbing the tree after them. We ate them raw when we could not make a fire. After 22 days and nearly dead from starvation, the explorers staggered out of the wilderness, first meeting escaped convicts from Tasmania. They later met some new settlers to the Victorian coast, who fed and looked after the men as best they could. During this entire trip, Strzelecki had been keeping up with his map making, creating the first accurate charts of the region. One of these he gave to the young man who had travelled with him, leaving a personalised inscription. To Riley, from your fellow monkey eater, Strzelecki. Of course, all of these early Europeans were talking about the koala, an animal that was all but extinct when Europeans first arrived in New South Wales. The first-hand accounts of naturalists, like Strzelecki, reveal an issue that, as far as I can see, has rarely been mentioned about those early years of colonisation. The reason why it took so long for anyone to see a koala is that there were literally no koalas to be seen. When the first fleet arrived in Sydney in 1788, there was already a very large population of indigenous living around future Sydney. It was likely this robust population that had hunted the marsupial to extinction in the region. We return to Australia's first naturalist, Colonel Patterson, who would later record about just such a hunt. The natives examined, with wonderful rapidity and minuteness, the branches of the loftiest gum trees, and upon discovering a koala, they climb the tree in which it is seen, with as much ease and expedition as a European would mount a tolerably high ladder. Having reached the branches, which are sometimes 40 or 50 feet from the ground, they follow the animal to the extremity of a bow, and either kill it with a tomahawk or take it alive. So it was only once explorers got out into the less populated arid regions that they encountered the koala, and even then they were still rare. This lack of koalas led John Gould in 1838 to contemplate that one of the continent's most iconic animals were certain to become gradually more scarce and to be ultimately extirpated. Uncomfortably, the possible saving grace of the koala and the reason why their numbers rebounded for a short time was another extinction event. Their main predators, the indigenous themselves, began to die in huge numbers due to various reasons stemming from European diseases like smallpox. And it was possibly those tragic deaths that explain why the koala for a short time had a population resurgence. Travelling forward a century and the city of Rockhampton was the most northern city of the New South Wales colony, the last true robust population of koalas was discovered. During the 19th and early 20th century, the demand for quality furs was high internationally, and Australia was considered the last great frontier of the international fur trade. Luckily for this little marsupial, koala pelts were considered lower grade fur, so for over a hundred years the demand for the skins was low, and there was never much of an industry to harvest their pelts. However, this all changed when it was discovered the thick, soft koala pelt was a particularly effective insulator against the cold was robust enough for any sort of use, and most importantly, it was waterproof. So in North America and other regions that suffered brutal winters, the demand for koala pelts exploded. By the 1890s, the koala was being exterminated across the colonies of Victoria and New South Wales to supply this growing demand, and their population soon crashed. This hunting didn't go unnoticed, however and public concern for the koala's survival soon had colonies like Victoria introducing legislation to protect the marsupial. An 1898 proclamation headed Native Bears to be deemed native game and protected was introduced to the local government. This was a good first step, but for a time all this did was force Victorian koala hunters to take their skins to New South Wales and sell them there. Tragically, what helped end the mass slaughter of koalas in the southern states was that there were just simply no longer any koalas around to mass slaughter. As early as 1899, we have stories of koala hunters finding it hard to find any animal to shoot as local populations had been wiped out. It seems hunters were now armed with Winchester repeating rifles, just like the ones so many cowboys carry in Hollywood westerns. The newspaper, the Manning River Times, jokingly reported that Football this season seems to be as dead as the native bear locally, 
And he, thanks to Winchester bullets, is enriching the soil with his skinless carcasses all over the campaign country. Koala hunters around their campfires, these cold nights tell the most amazing yarns and to their prowess as marksmen. Shades of William Tell, the wondrous exploits of that marksman of historic renown are not a circumstance to be compared with what the koala shooter can do when he likes. But then, we live in Australia, where tall trees, tall men and tall yarns abound. For the southern skin hunters, what was needed was a new source, and the recently opened forests of central Queensland proved ripe for the slaughter. Evidence of the abundance of animals in the central Queensland region comes from a handbook to the marsupial and monitoring mata published in London in 1894. The koala must be an abundant animal, since from 10,000 to 30,000 skins are annually imported into London, while in 1889 the enormous total of 300,000 was reached. The value of these skins now ranges, and they are mainly used in the manufacture of those articles for which a cheap and durable fur is required. Only a few of the skins would end up in local products. Most were sent to overseas fur markets, especially in the United States and England, where they were turned into hats, gloves and other pieces of clothing. As we know, the soft fur proved to be waterproof, making it a desired skin in these trades. Yet so many skins were coming from Australia, they caused a glut in the market, and the fur completely lost its value. Many of these skins were simply wasted in low-grade leather products. Let's put that into perspective. Today, the Australian Koala Foundation estimates there are only 57,920 koalas left in the wild though this number could be as low as 32,065. That's it. The total koalas alive today is about the same as the lowest number of skins being harvested a year in the 1880s. In 1889, the enormous total of 300,000 was achieved. Tragically, almost criminally, that number would be dwarfed by what was about to come. At the turn of the century, year after year, hunters scoured Queensland forests for koalas, and they killed them in the millions. In fact, the slaughter was so horrendous that a short koala hunting season was introduced to try and slow down the killings. Of course, this did nothing of the kind, as hunters just continued shooting koalas, and then storing the skins until the season opened and they were legal to sell. By 1905, government officials knew the koala population was not inexhaustible. In one report, it was recognised that Queensland's koala was threatened with the extermination owing to the value of its pelt, and that they had no law to protect the harmless native bear, which is in no way a pest. Another report shows that between 1888 and July 1918, at least 4 million koala furs had passed through London's auction houses, and England was not the main market, the US was. Things became so bad that the Queensland Minister for Agriculture, Mr John White, came under increasing pressure to protect the marsupial, and he introduced new laws that did just that, and for a short time the killing stopped. Yet these laws were loosened around 1919, when a six-month open season netted over one million skins. And the killings continued year after year during the ongoing open seasons. Happily things were changing. The Australian voter began to see the koala as one of its national icons, and the stories of them being killed by the hundreds of thousands every year and facing extinction got the voter putting pressure on their local governments. This leads us to 1927, the very last year of the official koala hunting season. Despite scientists and public groups loudly calling for an end to the slaughter, the season still opened in late 1927. Now again I feel we need some perspective here on what's about to happen. By 1924, Queensland's dense forests were the last real stronghold for the koala. In South Australia and New South Wales, the animal was all but gone. In Victoria, a rough estimate put the total population at only 500. The president of the Wildlife Preservation Society for Australia, David Steed, warned that around 300,000 koalas would be killed during this season a number that supporters of the hunt simply laughed at. Later, the annual report from the Department of Agriculture and Stock for the year 1927 to 1928 put the number killed at 584,738. But this was just the number of skins sent to market. This does not include any pelt ruined by the hunt and not collected, and the number of animals shot but the hunter was unable to find. It also doesn't include the young that were discarded from dead mothers as being too small to sell. 
Some estimates raise this number to over 800,000 dead. Remember, the highest estimates, there are less than 60,000 koalas left in Australia today. The end. In 1927, there were a few hunters being prosecuted and fined for hunting koalas out of season. Yet despite these controls and a limit on how many could be sold, suddenly one million wombat skins showed up in these foreign markets. Yet a check showed almost all of these were koala skins. Remember the official number killed was just over 500,000. So now we have evidence that well over 1.5 million koala skins had been harvested in 1927. And yet despite all the local pressure, it looked like the practice would continue. But it suddenly ended by a surprising source, the future US president, Herbert Hoover, who in 1927 was the USA Secretary for Commerce. Hoover as a young man had spent some time in Australia as a geologist and helped start a mining company that would one day become the Rio Tinto Company. It's this link to Australia that likely led him to acting to save the animal, as he knew it was iconic to the southern nation. Hoover ordered that the skins could no longer be imported into the US and signed protection acts for the koala into US law. And thus, the trade died. Now, at the time, Rocky had been a major source for koala skins as the animal was so abundant. Yet today, the region has been so depopulated of koalas, there have been only about 100 recorded wild sightings since 1930 in the entire Capricorn region. And if you're outraged at this industry and these numbers, well, I have some bad news for you. Koala culls keep coming back. In fact, it seems every year, one Australian state or another is calling for a cull. The Natural Resources Committee, NRC, yesterday told a Southern Australian parliamentary inquiry that koalas, corellias, fur seals and other native animals were reaching unmanageable levels across the state and needed to be culled, poisoned and euthanised, according to Adelaide Now. Now, to be fair, koalas in these regions like Kangaroo Island, where the population is causing trouble, well, they're not natural. They were introduced in 1920 as part of a plan to stop the endangered species from becoming extinct on the Australian mainland. The marsupial population on these islands flourished, growing to about 27,000 koalas. And over the years, different land management techniques have been introduced throughout the years to control their numbers. Now, the one state that doesn't seem to be calling for culls is Queensland, where the future of the koala is bleak. Almost every report claims that the koala population is crashing, a tragic result for the state where they were once so numerous they supported an entire fur industry. And if this isn't strange enough, despite the 1927 culling, the koala was only listed as vulnerable to extinction across the whole of Queensland in 2012. Before we end, I will point out hunting was not the only reason for the decline of the koala. Even in the 1890s, scientists had recognised an unknown disease was impacting their population. Today, this has been identified as a form of conjunctivitis. But make no mistake, it was the widespread slaughter of the koala and the current deforestation of their home forests that is leading to their decline. And I guess that's my point about the constant calls for a cull. How about simple relocation? Sure, it costs money, but so what? We have entire regions of Australia where millions could be earned from international tourists seeing koalas in the wild. Regions today totally devoid of any koala population, yet still, the first answer to overpopulation is to cull. Surely, we are better than that. This was just one story from Central Queensland, and for more, including the presence of the real Jack the Ripper in the city, please book a time safari walking tour and find out about the bush rangers, bank robbers and characters that help create the modern city of Rockhampton. And I hope to see you there.